Okay, this video is about dietary protein. It's from this book right here, The Medical Reformation and Vegan Renaissance Bible by me. Um, basically what I did with the book is I rewrote the standard medical textbooks. Um, so first point about dietary protein is what is a protein? A protein is made out of amino acids. It's basically like a string of beads, like a necklace of all these amino acids connected to each other. The structure of an individual amino acid is right in the center of it, you've got a carbon. Okay, and that carbon in the center of it is called the alpha carbon. And on top of it, you always have a hydrogen. Think of it being like your head, H. That's your head. And you're always going to have a hydrogen right there. That does not vary, so you can just take it for granted. Okay, on one side of it, you have an amino group attached to the carbon. Carbons can have four bonds, all right? So on one side, you'll have an amino group, and that's why it's called an amino acid. And over here, you have an acid. This is a carboxylic acid. When you have a carbon double bonded to oxygen, it's called a carbonyl group with a hydroxyl group on it. That's a carboxylic acid, okay? And that also is invariant. It's always there. You always have an amino group on one side and a carboxylic acid on the other side. And then the variable is the R group. So I describe this as being almost like a, you know, Jesus on a crucifix, okay? H for the head. Imagine the heart is in the center. The heart's like the alpha carbon. One hand out to one side is the amino group. Another hand to the other side is the carboxylic acid. And then it's only the legs, if you will, the R group, that... Um, are variable. And so that's why you can abbreviate an amino acid just alpha R. So alpha is the alpha carbon and there's the R group. You automatically know there's a hydrogen up here, an amino here, and a carboxylic acid right there. This is the variable. Okay, then to make a protein you just have to connect a whole bunch of amino acids. You can connect many thousands of them together to make a big protein. Smaller proteins will, you know, just have like a peptide will have 50 or less. And then other, you know, smaller proteins will have a little more than that. Alright, so here is one amino acid coming together with another amino acid. In the process it's a dehydration reaction. Water is removed and you can see, so here's, here's the first amino acid. Or we'll actually call this the first amino acid. So here's the carboxylic uh, carbon. You know, the carbonyl group, C double bonded to oxygen. Now it, it's bound to the nitrogen of the amino group or the second amino acid, okay? And that is a peptide bond. And so all of those connected together, that's how you make a protein. Okay, then probably like the most important slide from the talk today is this one right here. And the point of it is that by the way, if you, if you like any of these slides, all you got to do is hit the button for print screen and you can print the slide and then you'll have it for yourself. Here, I'll even get myself kind of off the picture here so you can get a nicer slide of it. And you can save these in your own PowerPoint file and then you'll have them if you want to, to study a subject, okay? Like when I would be interested in really learning a subject well, I would have a set of condensed notes. Let me see if I got one right next to me. Um, I didn't think of it. It just sort of spontaneously happened. And I would take pictures into the book. So, like, let's say you're studying nutrition. You really like this slide. Because this is a valuable slide. I'm going to make some really good points on this one. Okay, so, for example, animal protein is very much like human protein. There's 20 amino acids approximately. We, we say there's 20. And then about half of them are essential amino acids, meaning that our body can't make them. So, plant foods, though unlike animal foods, are often deficient in some of the amino acids. Like if you take beans um, and grains and rice, they tend to be low in methionine. Oh, I'm sorry, if you take beans, they tend to be low in methionine. So I wrote beans negative. But beans are overall high in protein. Beans on average have about 30% of calories from protein. Some a little more, some a little less than that. All right. Um, on the other hand, rice and grains have plenty of methionine. Now in contrast, if you look at lysine, Beans have plenty of lysine, and the peas just go with beans. Um, but the grains and the rice are low in lysine. So if you only ate uh, rice and grains, you would be low in lysine. If you only ate beans, you might be a little bit low in methionine. Not necessarily, though, because there's so much protein in beans. All right. Um, the reason I go into this is a lot of times people say, oh, there's a much, 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 much lower risk of... Um, cancer because there's much lower amount of protein being ingested and often you're a little bit deficient. Whatever amino acid you're in 
that's deficient relative to the other ones and potentially is going to limit protein synthesis, prevent the cells from replicating, that's called the limiting amino acid. So for rice and grains, it'll be lysine. For you know beans, it'll be methionine. All right. Uh, and the reason I'm going through all this is that Animals that eat lower protein diets, humans when they eat lower protein diets, they, they're less likely to activate mTOR, mammalian target arapamycin, the nutrient sensing pathway. There's like a contractor getting ready to build, but it needs its building materials available. And the rate limiting step tends to be having available amounts of leucine, a branch chain amino acid, essential amino acid, and methionine, an essential amino acid that contains sulfur. Okay, so what I'm basically saying here is if you eat a meal with a lot of rice, let's say, for breakfast, and then you eat a meal for dinner with beans but no rice, you might be a little low relative because the body can't store them for that long. For a real brief amount of time, I'm not sure the exact amount. I've read three hours in some animal studies, but I don't know exactly what it is in humans. You're not, it's not likely to be much longer than that. We don't really store nitrogen. So what will happen then is you're going to be a little low in both, and maybe that will prevent mTOR from being activated. Also, you know, exercising makes you tired. Your body's got to replenish energy rather than replicate cells and grow. That will also sort of shut off mTOR for a while. Okay, so but what I'm saying is if you're eating them both together, like currently I'm eating, you know, the OMAD diet, one meal a day diet, where I combine rice and beans quite often, um, am I then getting all these amino acids anyways getting similar to me? Overall, plant foods tend to have much lower amounts of uh, protein than do animal foods. You know, look at salmon, the classic food, 50 per, classic animal food, 50% protein, 50% fat. That's a lot of protein. Okay, you get into, you know, rice is about 7% of the calories from protein. Um, that's low. You know, potatoes are about 8% of the calories from protein. Sweet potatoes are about 4.5% uh, of the calories from protein. So that's pretty low amounts of protein. Um, all right, now another thing that's a little weird is glyphosate, the chemical used as a herbicide sprayed on GMO soy, for example, but also sprayed on other non-organic crops too. It's sprayed on non-organic oats, sprayed on non-organic beans. It has glycine attached to a phosphate. There's a little more to it than that, but basically that's about what it is. And it can mimic glycine. It can interpose itself into proteins, get put into proteins. And Stephanie Sanders has written a lot about that, and that's why it can be very toxic. Also, glycine is, a, is part of a coincident detector system in the brain in the NMDA receptors for glutamate. And so what I'm basically saying is it can function, it's thought, as an excitotoxin, increasing activation in the NMDA receptor on brain cells to allow calcium to enter into cells and cause them to be uh, hyperactivated, okay? So it can have a excitotoxin-like effect. Plus, proteins that have a lot of glutamate in them, like gluten, you know, uh, that's why it's called gluten, because it has a lot of glutamate in it. Casein and whey, the milk protein, soy protein does also, and corn's just very cheap to extract glutamate from. Anyways, the more these are processed, the more they free up free glutamate, and that ends up being a big deal, because we taste it on the umami receptors in our mouth, and they make us like the taste of a food, and we can even become addicted to the food for, that'll contribute to that effect. Um, the more amino acid you eat, you know, it's an amino acid. You put an acid load on your body, and that leads to calcium being excreted by the kidneys, increased calcium in the urine, it's called calciura. It increases the risk of kidney stones, okay? And also, it'll lead to some demineralization, taking calcium out of the bones when you eat a lot of animal protein. Animal protein has a lot more sulfur groups, cysteine and methionine, sulfur-containing amino acids. And part of the degradation of those amino acids is that some of it gets made into sulfuric acid and it creates a low-grade metabolic acidosis and part of the buffering system involves you know the excretion of calcium with the hydrogen in the kidneys causing calciuria and you can get calcium precipitating in the kidney tubules and increasing the risk of kidney failure over time so that's not good but the key point of this of this slide really was you know we talked about what's up with the sulfur groups in the animal proteins we talked about tons of this glutamate manufactured free glutamate being freed up by processing foods we talked about glycine being an excitotoxin, not to mention, you know, harmful in a lot of other ways. The, the glyphosate and its mimicking of glycine doing that. And then we talked about, you know, the relative opposite nature of rice compared to beans, okay? Um, so that, that, that's kind of an important concept. That's going to come up a lot. If you study anything about protein, this is going to come up. That's why I said this is a valuable slide right here if you, if you care about protein. 
Okay, what else? Anything else interesting here? The limiting amino acid, we talked about that, the one that can limit protein synthesis because it's deficient relative to the others. Uh, we also have talked about the idea of protein quality being kind of a joke. T. Colin Campbell is great, and he's like the world expert of protein, and he basically says protein quality is nonsense. It's based on how fast, fast can you grow a farm animal and how much does the protein mimic the animal's own constitution, if you will. And he says that's stupid, though, because for humans, that would mean that the best, highest quality protein would be cannibalism, okay? And that's obviously not good for us. And everybody knows the argument as well that, um, you know, you can feed a horse, a horse, a bull, all these, an elephant, all these giant animals, the dinosaurs. They just ate plants, okay, the ones we're interested in. And they get to be huge. So you don't need the meat. Humans can be quite athletic and strong without it, okay? Um what else would I say is interesting? Oh, everybody knows too, caloric restriction leads to increased life of the animals across numerous different species. But nobody wants caloric restriction with the idea you have to starve. That's not appealing. But if you just switch from eating animal foods to eating plant foods, you're probably going to eat fewer calories. And thus, that's a way of partially caloric restricting. Then the next point of the matter is it turns out if you just restrict protein, it appears that you get the same benefit, it's thought that you do based on the animal studies, that you get the same benefit as one does from restricting calories. So what I'm saying is it can be painful and difficult to restrict calories in a significant way, but it can be easy to restrict protein in a similar way, and it appears that you're probably going to get all the same benefits. And examples of protein-restricted diets would be just, you know, in general, a vegan diet is about 80-10-10, 80% carbohydrate, 10% fat, 10% protein, which is pretty low in protein. They're going to tell you that omnivore, sad diet, and these other diets are about 16% protein, but I don't believe that. I think that's BS. I think they're higher than that because, you know, if you're eating salmon, for example, it's 50% of your calories from protein, and a lot of people are eating lots of meat where the amount of protein percentage of calories is much higher Okay, the vegan has to be a little careful if they eat too much beans. I think that their protein numbers can get quite high. Uh, but Kempner's diet was very low in protein. Vegan diets in general, McDougal diet, Esselstyn diet, my Spartan vegan diet, whatever low-fat vegan diet you can think of is going to be typically pretty low in protein, except for you know how much beans you eat can be the, the variable. But that's the point. If you just restrict, and it even, oh, here's another point. Not only can just restricting protein give you the same effect it's thought as caloric restriction but you can even just restrict a single amino acid so maybe if you just avoided one of those things or certainly avoided them at different times of the day you might get the same benefit okay and the longest lived people were the vegans in the seventh day adventist study okay so here i wrote it out as an equation Caloric restriction can be equaled by protein restriction, and this apparently can be equaled by methionine restriction. So if all you have to do is, you know, to just reduce your intake of one amino acid, one essential amino acid, that might be very easy to do, okay, versus caloric restriction, like we said, that might be hard to do. This could be pleasantly easily done. Okay, glutamic acid is amino acid. So here's a glutamic acid, and of course, here's the stuff. It's always going to have an amino group, always going to have a carboxylic, always going to have a hydrogen. So here's the variable, the R group. And it's got three carbons and then a carboxylic acid thing. So it's kind of like a propanoic acid is attached to it. Aspartate is really almost the same thing, except it's only got two carbons instead of three. So I sometimes think of that as baby glutamate. And that's also um, an excitotoxin. It sort of has the effect of an excitatory neurotransmitter activating brain cells, activating the postsynaptic neuron. And when overdone, like this is a component of aspartame, it's thought to have an excitotoxin effect that can cause brain damage. Just like excessive amounts of glutamic acid can cause brain damage by functioning as an excitotoxin. Okay, and then the food companies will put tons of this in the food because the more glutamate they can get in there with the more sodium, the more fat, the more they can optimize the mouthfeel when they research on a bunch of people that come along um, and, and the more sweet they can make it that the people like. It's called reaching the bliss point, you know. And the food company spent a long time trying to figure that out. That's why they got commercials like, you, I bet you can't eat just one Jay's potato tip because it tastes so good. Um, they, this is called making the food hyper palatable, but it's unnatural. Um, and that's why people can be addicted to all these junk foods. That's why you, you want to just avoid them cold turkey. You know? So it's like, you know, people enjoy the feeling of using heroin, but it's not a good idea, okay? All right, so here is uh, a, a picture of that idea, again, of the bliss point. Uh, well, of, of how you make this 
MFG means manufactured free glutamate. MSG is monosodium salt of glutamate, where you'd have a, you know, an Na plus bound to that, um, the OH there. Instead of having the H, you'd have the uh, Na plus, but, so it's a salt of glutamate. But here you've got manufactured free glutamate. What does that mean, manufactured free glutamate? It just means you start out with a protein, and then you break up these peptide bonds. And when you do that, you free up the individual glutamate amino acids. And the more of them you free up, the more the person gets a bolus of, of glutamate in their mouth. And it's the glutamate that matters. The MSG doesn't matter. It's the glutamate that matters because that's what activates those umami receptors. Our ancestors worried about starvation. So for them to find a good protein source was a way to help them prevent dying of starvation. Um, so they get reward neurotransmitters in their brain release when they ingest a bunch of umami, a bunch of glutamate. So that's why it's pleasantly uh, experienced. But it's not good for our health when it's present in excessive amounts. The more they process the food in whatever way, like let's say they take milk, they ferment it, they ultra pasteurize it, they extract something, hydrolyze it, they fat separate it, homogenize it. Every time they process it, they're, they're freeing up more of these glutamate amino acids and they're going to make the food more addictive to people. Um, so it just means more free glutamate amino acids. All right, and that's all we're going to cover in this chapter for now on protein. So the key point was that you can maybe probably significantly greatly increase longevity just respecting one amino acid. And it's good to know about the glutamate and a few other things. So hope that was interesting and helpful.